I'm uh, the co-founder and the chief scientist at D-Wave. Um, and uh, so I've, I've had a number of jobs. Uh, originally, I had this conception that in order to bring quantum computing to the world sooner rather than later, um, you know, you'd want to assemble the best and brightest people from all over the world. So, so my first job was, you know, you get the best physicists, mathematicians, computer scientists, get them excited about this idea, assemble a team. So that was what I did in the early days. Um, in addition to that, um, the, the core technology that underlies our quantum processor is something called superconducting electronics. So uh, before I was at D-Wave, I was at a company called TRW, which is, uh, which is what we did. We built these complex superconducting circuits and those uh, superconductors are these very unusual materials. They dissipate no energy at low temperature um, or exceedingly little energy um, and have quantum mechanics at macroscopic scales. So when, when I was at TRW and when I was looking at the field of quantum computing, you know, this light bulb went off. I said, you know, most people are trying to build quantum computers out of microscopic constituents. And it's very hard, you know, they're very tiny, <laughs> atoms and molecules and photons. So um, it's very hard to engineer their properties um, and to build a control infrastructure, to build real devices. So when I was at TRW building superconducting devices, and because you had quantum mechanics at macroscopic scales, we said, well, we can build circuits that, have all, that are replete with the, the most amazing phenomenon in nature that we could harness and build real devices. So um, because I had that background, once we assembled a team, um, I, I was the one who designed the integrated circuit stack and then put, uh, took superconductivity out of the research labs, took it to uh, Silicon Valley and taught semiconductor engineers how to build superconducting circuits. And in a couple of years, we bypassed the, the capability on Earth to build very complex superconducting circuits. So, I, so my job now is um, I run the group that builds the processors. And uh, I also run a lot of the R&D, like you know, defining our technology roadmap, what research do we have to do to get to the next generation. The key idea is that um, all the problems you mentioned, so uh, you have large complex systems where you have a large number of variables interacting in incredibly complex ways. And what you're trying to get at is out of all of that, um, either you're trying to see you're trying to model that data uh, in the simplest form possible so that you can gain insights because just having a lot of data doesn't do you any good, right? Yeah. You, have to, you have to build a model of that data to get, to get uh, actionable insights. And um, the problem is that building models on that data usually is intractable classically. The number of computations you have to do explodes exponentially because the number of, um, you know, say you're looking at, uh, you were talking about financial markets or something. Um, you, you, ha you take 500 stocks, you know, or companies, and you look at all their incredibly complex interactions, and you say, well, let's build a model of that. How would you build a portfolio to minimize risk, right? And, and um, there's too many scenarios to look at. The number of scenarios explodes exponentially. And classical computing systems, at best, scale linearly, right? So if you, you take two processors, you get 2x. 3x, 4x for every processor, but it's not even that good. You know, typically for large supercomputers like the Titan supercomputer with 3 million cores, maybe you have best case 10% efficiencies. So maybe it's 300,000x. But you have problems where you're going to have to explore billions, trillions, uh, you know, two to, you know, 10 to the 500th possible scenarios. And classical physics can't do that. So any, it doesn't matter, you'll, you'll hear about all these different processor technologies, like what about DNA computing? What about uh, neuromorphics, where you build computing that's like brains? The problem is, unless you harness uh, uh, a, res a computing resource that scales exponentially, you'll never be able to address those problems. The only thing that we know that blows up exponentially like that is the number of dimensions or the number of you know, parallel worlds um, if you can access quantum dynamics. Because quantum mechanics describes a world in which there's many parallel realities and the number of parallel realities kind of explodes exponentially. So you can have a linear number of 
computational elements, but the number of possibilities they can explore expands exponentially in what's called the multiverse. So quantum dynamics is the only physical phenomenon we know that scales in this exponential way like the problems we're trying to solve as a civilization. And that's what's exciting about it. Um, I mean, I often, I often make the point that either as a civilization we have to downsize because uh, the complexity of all of our institutions, whether it's transportation or energy distribution, defense networks, uh, whatever it is, they've all ceased to be, uh, exceeded our ability to model them and understand them. And that, that can lead to catastrophe. Um, and certainly, in the best case, really suboptimal operation of those things. And, and we're sorely in need of um, understanding the world better, taming the complexity of the world so that we don't destroy the world. Um, and I think being a, it's, it's kind of a funny thing, almost a science fiction-like idea, but, but by accessing parallel universes and harnessing information processing in, in them all and bringing that information back to us might be the only way that we can solve the problem of complexity. First, uh, you know, from, say from the D-Wave perspective, my company, we already have quantum computers that you can access over the internet, right? So there are people who will access our main facilities in uh, Vancouver, Canada, and we have uh, a number of researchers, you know, it could be universities, it could be corporations that will access our quantum processors to start understanding how they might use them in commercial applications. Um, and what we're planning to is in the next few years is exactly what you said, to install these like in a cloud service so that more people can access these. And with our current generation processors, for some problems, uh, we exceed state of the art, right? And, some, and, and for some uh, particular problems like something that Google ran, we were 100 million times faster. And these are early days, right? So early generation. So um, right now, uh, I would say something like in the next few years, three to five years, and certainly five to 10 years, I think quantum computing systems will become available. Uh, and that's certainly what our plan is, that will exceed all the capabilities on Earth and they'll be available via the cloud. Um, there's other companies too now. I think uh, we took the lead in this, but um, there, you know, whether it's you know, IBM uh, or Google's or the Microsoft's of the world, they all have their own internal quantum computing efforts. And now people are starting to offer um, uh, cloud-like services, access uh, through their cloud portals for their you know, much smaller quantum computers than D-Wave right now. But it's an exciting time because I think uh, for a long time people thought, ah, quantum computing is 50, 100 years away. And I think D-Wave um, that we've kind of sparked the imagination that it's sooner rather than later. Uh, and with the right kind of teams, putting really good teams together with the right kind of financing, um, that we'll get there much sooner than later. And so in the next decade, I could imagine having quantum computing available uh, uh, through the cloud and enabling all kinds of possibilities that uh, w were, people didn't even think to do before. Because uh, if you think something's impossible, you don't bother. <laughs> And now I think people are getting a sense like there's ways of doing computing and machine learning and machine intelligence on large data sets to solve really big problems um, that uh, people are starting to understand may be possible in the next few years. And so the collective imagination of the world is, has been excited and people are already developing algorithmic schemes um, to address that. There's companies like uh, One Qubit in Canada, uh, a group of machine learning specialists they have a, a term that I kind of like, what they call quantum ready algorithms. It's like, it's on its way. We better have the algorithmic um, ideas put together when it comes online to harness that sooner rather than later. Say a D-Wave, you know, there's um, kind of the equivalent of low level machine code for the quantum processor, you know, the physics-y stuff. Um, and we've already developed, say a D-Wave, several levels of abstraction. So someone can write in Python or C++ or whatever it is. Um, without understanding the quantum dynamics, but just understanding, let's say, a certain problem they want to solve, they can just send it, and it will be kind of compiled and translated into the effective machine code of the quantum processor. So we've already done it, that at D-Wave for our kind of quantum computing, and there are groups all over the world, say for gate model quantum computing, for the different kinds of models of quantum computing, that are developing languages and ways for people to access this. Because like I said, there's this excitement now about the inevitability of this.
For a long time it was thought, this is gonna be a long time, maybe in 100 years we'll have one of these things, and now people are thinking maybe in the next decade um, where they'll be at scale solving real commercial problems, and the infrastructures to access them you know, for the general computing community is already underway. Um, quite aggressively. So. Well, something, something I want to share is more philosophical than technical or about technology, but I think um, what's very important is um, we currently live in a world that's uh, replete with some very serious problems. You know, we humans, uh, seven billion of us, um, are putting enormous strains on the environment, uh, destroying the biosphere that, that's our home. Um, we um, whether it's, I think the great challenge of the 21st century is to not destroy the biosphere and to figure out a sustainable future. Uh, I think that uh, you know, social injustice and the problem of complexity itself, um, that we've built systems that uh, overwhelm uh, our capabilities to understand. You know? So in every area of human endeavor, uh, whether it's energy distribution or education, healthcare, transportation, um, we have such complex systems that they're being run very suboptimally and they're, they're subject to uh, s significant crashes. Um, and so I think what, what I'd like to leave you with is I think it's not enough to do technology for its own sake because it's interesting or because you can generate commerce. I think Everyone needs to think about a vision of a future that they would like to live in. You know, picture a world you'd like to live in, and what are you doing to bring that world uh, into existence? How is your day-to-day -day life, and how is what you work on contributing to uh, a place that you'd like to live and you'd like to see others? Um, and I, I think that's a, the, you know, these most significant questions of the 21st century is, you know, we, we're in this technological adolescence. You know, we've seen our, cleverness outstrip our wisdom. And what I'd like to see is people focusing on getting wiser and thinking about the consequences of what they do and to try to build a world um, where, uh, you know, I, I watched a lot of Star Trek as a kid, so I said, you know, I'd like to see a world where uh, we've figured out how to live sustainably, uh, go to the stars, uh, have social equity, um, and, um, Anyway, so that's, that's what I'll leave you with. I think it's, it's a very important thing for everyone involved in technology to think about what it all means.